thanks for uh, for inviting me. Um, uh, you asked me to talk about uh, early warning and climate tipping points, but my mind has been more on tipping points in society lately. So I thought uh, I'd just uh, share my um, my thoughts about that with you and, and hope we can have a nice discussion and you can uh, help me think about this topic because it's really something that uh, I don't have really complete and clear in, in my mind. So it's just sharing a bit of um, thinking process. Um, one of the inspirations, um, as uh, mathematicians uh, used to say, is that I feel that uh, changes in the air, so to say, in, in society. If you uh, follow the news a bit, uh, you'll see that over the past years, everywhere around the world, people have uh, taken to the streets. Um, in Chile, where I am often, and this is Santiago de Chile in the middle, uh, we had those huge crowds, the whole country was in, uh, in turmoil, and they are actually going to rewrite their constitution with a group of citizens consisting of 50% uh, male, 50% female. Uh, so things are, things are happening. And um, when, when change is uh, like imminent, it can go in many different directions. I don't know if you've been uh, following a little bit what, um, what uh, Barack Obama has been saying about the elections. But one of the things that he said um, in interviews coming after his, uh, his memoirs came out is that um, he understood the people that voted first for him and then for Obama because uh, he understands that people are basically wanting change and he was change and, and also Trump was change. So it's just votes for people uh, apparently wanting change and change of course is needed and you all know that the climate is changing and uh, and it's worrying maybe you saw the the paper we did on the future of the human climate niche with tim lenton and others predicting that one third of humanity may need to move to a different place in uh, only half a century and that's a lot of people so yeah it's uh, it, it, there, there are many reasons that, as a scientist, you may say there is a need for change. Also, the loss of biodiversity, um, the loss of uh, nature, the increase of inequality. Um, yeah, change is needed and change is probably inevitable. If one third of humanity is moving to another place, um, we are talking about a likely transformation of the world. And the question, um, perhaps the, one of the big questions of our times is if we can have that transformation uh, in, a, in a graceful way of, or whether it will be um, a more violent uh, transition. So one of the questions um, that, that we've been asking uh, recently with a, with a group, in, including uh, Tim Lenton again and others, is how big transitions happened in the past, whether there were tipping points in the past. And, and one of the data sets we've been mining is a data set of the birth and the death of society. You see here timelines for each civilization, when they started and when they ended. And we've been looking a bit into the pattern. And what you see is that there are distinct waves of birth and death. And of course, an obvious question is whether they're related to, to climate. And yes, there is a bit of a signal there related to climate. This is one of the climate signals we've been looking at, but it's, it's not so clear. So actually another thing we are um, pondering is the idea that civilizations age, like people age, and when they get old, they become fragile. And at some point, they die. So is that true? Do civilizations proceed towards a tipping point like we all 
proceed towards the tipping point of death, so to say, when we are less resilient. Um, that's a fascinating idea, but the question is, can you actually measure that? There is lots of stories about that. If you read um, books on archaeology and, and articles, there is lots of speculation. But it would be nice, of course, if we could uh, somehow show that this is actually really happening. Well, you know, I guess most of you know this work that we've been doing on dynamic indicators of resilience. And the idea being that if you have a resilient system and you perturb it, it may recover quite fast um, because the slope is steep, because if you want the dominant eigenvalue of the Jacobian matrix is large, the return time to equilibrium. Whereas if you have a low resilience, the slope is less steep and recovery upon a micro perturbation will take longer. And the idea of course would be that in real systems if you can't um, perturb them experimentally you can just look at um, how they fluctuate over time and then if you uh, think that the regime of perturbation has remained the same you expect the system to respond differently if it has a lower resilience you expect higher temporal autocorrelation higher variance so um I guess you've seen, most of you have seen um, uh, all the literature about that, and we have had uh, indeed this wonderful project um, of uh, the, the Marie Curie project, uh, working further on this, uh, in which uh, quite a few of you have been involved. So uh, the question uh, we had is, uh, can we find those signals also for past civilizations? Um, there are um, a few studies on that, uh, some on, um, on Neolithic civilizations really long uh, ago, uh, pretty coarse temporal resolution, so not so easy. Um, recently, we came across an amazing time series of civilizations in the American Southwest, the so-called Pueblo people, the Anasazi they were called before, uh, close to the, the Santa Fe Institute. And what is so special about um, our data on those civilizations is that the archaeologists have collected pieces of wood from all those constructions and all those pieces of wood, they have looked at the tree rings, uh, which allowed them to date the moment when that tree has been cut and also reconstruct the climatic conditions at the same time. So now we have, for a period of 800 years, we have uh, basically the tree cutting activity of um, those people. And in those 800 years, uh, several times, uh, their uh, culture collapsed and restarted again. And that has been studied for, um, for a long time already. You can see it very clearly because they abandon the, um, the houses that they've built. They start um, building houses in new places. They make different kinds of pottery, different styles of pottery. They have different rituals. So basically they reinvent their society um, more or less every 200, 300 years. Um, now, what we were interested in is whether we could see that leading up to those uh, big transformations, there were, were actually signs of instability, indicators of reduced resilience, of, of critical slowing down. And we've looked at that for each of those periods and the manuscript is now um, with a journal. And here you see um, one, two, three, four, and a special fifth famous period. After this, they would collapse. This is the construction activity. This is the climate suitability for cultivating um, maize, cultivating corn. And um, this is the, those are the indicators of critical slowing down, the autocorrelation and the 
the variance. And you see that uh, quite uh, spectacularly leading up to the moment of collapse, you see these uh, indicators of critical slowing down, suggesting that there was increasing uh, social instability. And there is other evidence for that, uh, which is in line with what we find here, namely that there is more signs of violence. You find broken skulls uh, and, and other indicators of violence towards the end of the periods. So yes, um, there seemed to be kind of this, this pattern of uh, this civilization approaching criticality, becoming unstable, more social unrest, and then the whole thing crashes, except for the last period when something very different uh, happened. Uh, actually, people moved out of the whole area altogether. And I, if, you, if you're interested, I can talk more about, uh, about that. But the main point here is that um, we do see uh, real evidence for societies becoming fragile. And when that happens, they were ready to actually uh, abandon the way they used to do things and, and invent a whole new way of doing things. Usually, uh, also, if you look at the other archaeological evidence, the story repeats more or less. Uh, you have a successful society, which means um, it grows, uh, populations grow, uh, it expands, you also inevitably see increasing inequality. It goes together with uh, having a civilization. And uh, if there's shortages, uh, because they're outstripping the, the carrying capacity of the environment, and some have more than others, people become discontent. Then you see more violence. And when there is more violence, there is even more discontent to the point that the credibility of the whole system that holds them together, the social contract, the rituals, the elites that, that were leading the societies, uh, the credibility is low enough for uh, people to actually abandon the whole thing and find new ways of doing things. Um, an interesting question, of course, is could this happen again? Can we reinvent ourselves and start doing things in a very different way? Well, that's a really big question. Um, in no way can we compare ourselves to those ancient civilizations. Um, we, are, we are globalized, um, everything is different. Uh, we don't have the shortages they used to have. I mean, those people were dying of hunger, the children were dying of hunger, and um, that is now rare. Uh, in, uh, if you look for average uh, citizens of the world. Also, um, the violence we see is much less. And still, you know, there is, there is, this, uh, there is this activity, there is this uh, tension, um, there is this turmoil. And you may ask uh, why people are discontent, because we live in the best of times if you compare it to previous generations. And never were people so healthy, never did they live so long, never was there such a low violence, and never was there a better time to live than our time when you look at many objective indicators. Yet you see this discontent. And I find it an interesting question to, to ask whether um, the stability of our social contract also has been diminished because of this discontent. Do we have in some way a reduction of the stability of the at attractiveness, if you say, if you want to, to, to call it like that, uh, it could be, we could call it lost attraction. We're not attracted anymore to the way the world is running. Is that true? And is that discontent strong enough to, to facilitate big changes? Um, I think one reason that we see the discontent is that 
maybe we live in the best of times, but our perception of the world um, has changed quite a bit over the past 10 years. Um, we now get a very different impression. We see very clearly that others are better off. We see lots of problems. We see lots of conspiracy theories. All those things are, uh, are, have always been there, but they seem to be boosted by um, the way social media work. Uh, this discontent, of course, is also because there is uh, inequality, climate change, because people have work stress. Um, but it's uh, wherever it comes from, uh, it, it gives a kind of energy. And at the same time, social media allow for new forms of self-organization of people. And you could argue that as a result, you see more fighting the old way of doing things. And you see more new ways of doing things. And um, so I don't wanna dwell too much on this, except that um, uh, I think it's important to realize that this, uh, this uh, energy for change doesn't necessarily uh, move in a direction of a sustainable uh, future, uh, sustainable and just ways of doing things. It could move to, to very different um, ways of organizing the world. And it is moving in, in all kinds of directions. So I think it's a, it's a kind of um, fragmented revolution, if you want, uh, that, that we see. Uh, I think there is energy uh, and there are tipping points, but there's many small tipping elements, if you want, and it goes, it goes all over the place. So an, a question that I find really interesting is, uh, what is our role as scientists? Can we somehow um, help in providing uh, information, in providing uh, clear-cut stories that help um, moving towards a sustainable attractor, towards uh, what Tim Lenter will later talk about, uh, tipping positive change? Because of course, it's, it's not like the world has uh, one big tipping point uh, for climate and it's not like the world has one big tipping point for social change. It's a, it's a kind of scale-free complex web of uh, tipping elements that are connected. So one way to, to think about it is that um, very central in the way we, we behave and we organize the world is what you can call worldviews, the values we have, the norms, the beliefs, how we see the world. Um, and those things have an effect on how we do business, for instance, on politics, on uh, the way we organize our education. But the same is true the other way around. The way we see the world is affected by the way we're educated. The way the, the things we, we think we value and we want depend in part on the advertisement from that, that, we, that we see from, from business. It uh, depends on the language we have. The, the way we see the world affects our language, but we're also prisoners of the language um, that we shaped in the past. The same is true for arts. We are affected by the movies we see, by the novels, by the pop songs we hear. At the same time, this uh, yeasting uh, vessel of, of, uh, of society also affects the arts. So uh, we have this network in which uh, we would like to see um, tipping, positive tipping, so to say, tipping towards a, a positive future um, that, that helps creating um, a world where we control climate change, where we have less inequality, where there is more space for nature. And That's uh, the, the way I see the role of science is in part that we try to make this picture clear. 
and of course to what we do when we see changes in the natural world when we see for instance global warming and uh, then we say oh we know how that works um, and we know how to solve it we just need to be carbon neutral and we tell that to the world and then we hope it happens and when we see changes in the social world when we see that there is large inequality that there is corruption and violence we know how that works and we measure it we analyze it and we say okay this is how it works if we just do uh, things differently if we redistribute wealth for instance and uh, have a different tax system create a, a universal base income uh, then we'll solve that um, uh, we see the changes in biodiversity uh, we see that uh, nature needs more land we can do that if we have a plant-based diet you know, we just read this article in the lancet about uh, the the better diet for health and the environment. And if we do that, and uh, the world will be a better place. So that's what we, uh, we, we, we tend to be happy if we analyze this, analyze climate change and say, well, we, we should just do this and that, and that'll be solved. But I think it's also very interesting as a scientist to start thinking about how that actually uh, works because I think the problems uh, we have, if you if you ask me, I think there's a big three problems perhaps. One is that the climate is uh, warming, another is that we are losing nature, and a third is that we have a lot of inequality. And we know what to do about it. You know, we become carbon neutral, we have a plant-based diet, and we distribute redistribute wealth. Um, it's not that we don't know that, it's the 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 challenge is to understand how this complex system with its many tipping elements is working and how we can contribute to uh, make that world uh, like move to carve our own future as humanity. So in a way uh, we would be, uh, yeah, we, we are sense makers and I think uh, there is a lot of sense making in the world. You have lots of uh, of course, excellent uh, journalist sense making. Uh, Obama does sense making. Trump does sense making. We can also contribute to sense making. And um, yeah, I'm interested in in uh, trying to see how we can uh, evolve our systems thinking about uh, tipping elements to also include uh, unraveling a bit how the real machine works that uh, that we're all part of really so that's what i wanted to share with you and i'm interested in hearing so let's open up the discussion <laughs>